When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that gets up around whenever he used to get up on time. He is the captain. Yeah, that's called clinical depression. I don't think it's something you should be making fun of. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Wheatstone Bridge by Tin Whiskers Brewing Company Garage Grade 4 out of 5 bottle caps. And we're feeling frisky. This is a crisp and refreshing American style wheat beer with distinct flavors of honey and chamomile tea and the 2018 Beer Army Beer Wars Bronze Medal winner. Wheatstone Bridge was brought to us by these winners right here. First up we have Brina and Sunny Florida. And we have Amber and Andrea and Las Vegas. Next, we have Sam and Seward, Alaska. And a big shout out to Annie in Quebec, Canada. And here's a cheers to Alicia and Dee in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And last but not least, a big shout out to Mark in Northwest Columbus. Boo. Boo. So thanks to everybody out Boo. there. Thanks for what? You know what you did. You went to <laughs> truecrimegarage.com and you clicked on the donate button. I forgot. We're from Columbus. <laughs> Make sure you follow us on social media, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, at True Crime Garage, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. It's a voicemail unlike anything you've ever heard before. There are two minutes worth of noises, bizarre ones. But very little actual talking. Authorities confirmed the disturbing middle of the night call came from Henry McCabe's cell phone. It was Labor Day, September 7th at 2.28 in the morning. McCabe's worried wife, Heard the message. His and my cell phone connected. Minnesota Community Policing Services is a nonprofit agency and acts as a go between with police and the Liberian community. The leader is trying to help the family make some sense of this recording. The growls turned to high pitch moans. So, like, like, like he's moaning in pain. Mo- like moaning in pain. The tortured grunts suddenly stop. There is silence. Then someone, either Henry or another person, says, stop it. I try to picture where he was, um, what it might have been like, what circumstances 
would have made him sound like that. The voicemail is in stark contrast to other articulate recordings of McCabe speaking at an event. He's a state auditor. What is the justification? What is the right thing to do? The message is one piece of evidence Moundsview police are reviewing. The police chief tells me even the FBI is analyzing the recording and voices for clues. The chief says the investigation took deputies here on Tuesday. <laughs> to Rice Creek Park, which borders New Brighton, Moundsview and Fridley, all areas where McCabe was reported seen or a cell phone ping placed him. Ramsey County Water Patrol searched but came up empty. There you just heard it, portions of probably the strangest phone call, most mysterious phone call we've ever played on this show, and we have played some strange ones over the years. Brandon Lawson comes to mind, the West Mesa body pit case. There were strange phone calls in that one as well. I know Niner. A brief overview of this case, we have Henry McCabe. He is a Minnesota Revenue Department employee. On September 6, 2015, he's 32 years old and he goes out to a club with some friends. During the course of the evening, Henry has several drinks. Later, Henry and a friend are heading home when Henry supposedly convinced his friend to let him off at a gas station, mm -hmm. though no CCTV footage was found of Henry at an area gas station to confirm this. That was the last time he would be seen alive. Then at about 2.30 a.m., a voicemail from Henry was left on his wife's phone. On the call, you can clearly hear screaming and groaning in pain. Immediate searches for Henry McCabe would reveal nothing. Right, and there's not much here. So let's start with what we do have, and that is the audio from this voicemail. Now, there was a full-length version of this on the Internet, but for some reason it has since been taken down. Well, we think there was. I mean, this could be like urban legend now at this point. Well, right, but there there seems to be signs of this or evidence of this or even speculation of this. Right, because there are people online who have stated, hey, I know this was available at one time. I can't find it anymore. And we believe that the reporter is actually using the clip from the Internet that the police released. Correct. So this, like you said, the thought is that the police released this voicemail at some point i actually have some suspicions on this mm -hmm. and my suspicions are i wonder if they released the full two minutes I, right. I i don't think they did if i had to guess because you've seen the way that things are copied and printed and pasted and and left on the internet it seems to me like if there was once the full length audio i think it would there would be some version or some way of finding it still today. Right. If anybody is an internet expert and can try to find this clip, I'd really love to take it and dissect it and to see if we could basically analyze it just like we did with the Brandon Lawson case. And that was our first goal with this. Actually, you and I were quite excited about this case because we were told, hey, at the center of this young man's disappearance mm -hmm. is this strange horrifying phone call this voicemail two minutes long and right. we thought wow okay we can do exactly what we did with brandon Lawson. we can dissect it and we can really listen to it piece by piece inch by inch and kind of give our own opinion of what we think is happening during the course of that two minutes mm -hmm. because you heard that quick clip there there's some really strange horrifying is really the only thing that i that i keep the word i keep coming back to when I hear the groans and the screaming, there's some stuff that's almost like unexplainable too. that, you know, the, right. I, I tried weird to do the noise. It's almost but. like growling, but there's also this weird, how it goes from a, a lower pitch growl to almost like a high squeal mm -hmm. and very uh, unusual. So the clip that we played for you during the trailer is by far the most famous most popular clip of this audio. Mm -hmm. So if you do a quick search for Henry McCabe, nine one one call or Henry McCabe voicemail, Henry McCabe audio, any well, of those things, it will pull up usually that 
news clip first will be first in your 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 find there. Yeah, and let's just be clear, it's not a nine one one call, it's a it's a voicemail to his wife. Correct. Correct. I just said that because that's a common Google search in uh this this case. And I believe it's also confirmed that it was coming from his phone. One hundred percent. It was confirmed that it was coming from Henry's phone. Now, here's one thing that I really question. Mm-hmm. And this is why I question if at any time was the full length audio released. And that's because in every b- report I could find, they state you hear screaming, you hear moans, you hear groans, and you clearly hear someone. They, they very specifically say someone, either Henry or someone else, yell, stop it. Right. The problem with that, Captain, is you heard that clip, and I, I have already said that's probably the most popular of this clip, of this phone call. Right. You never actually hear that stop it portion or anybody yelling stop it, whether it be Henry or somebody else. I In all the different versions of audio I could find of this phone call, of this voicemail, I never found one that played that portion of the tape. Right, and you would think that this would be very similar to some of the other cases where you just have a clip that they they play over and over. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they would take this, stop it, and play it over and over on the news. And they they didn't for as, as much as I could find. Yeah, at no point could I find that. And then the thing that's very troubling about this is Henry is missing for quite some time. And you think that this stop it portion mm-hmm. of the audio would have been played for the public. So let's go through the timeline in a little more detail, shall we? Mm-hmm. So on Sunday, September 6th, 2015, Henry joins at least two friends. This is Calvin Johnson and William Pappas Kennedy at POV's club. This is a nightclub. Now, mm-hmm. there are going to be people familiar with this case, and they're going to say, Nick, that is not the name of the nightclub. This nightclub has held many names over the years. It's actually referred to as three different names in the reports I could find. For simplicity, I'm going to roll with POVs for the and what course does of the show. POV stand for? Do I you know. I don't know if it stands for anything or if it's just simply short for something. It should have been called POS. Well, this is on Highway 65, mm-hmm. and from everything I could find, Captain Henry McCabe and his friends are at this club just before the nine o'clock hour. At some point, according to the people at the club with Henry. Henry is so intoxicated that his friends decide to confiscate Henry's wallet so he cannot buy any more drinks. All right. So obviously he's buying so many drinks, but the bartenders are still serving Mm -hmm. and his friends say, hey, they're still serving him. So we need to take this in our own hands and take his wallet. There are you're going to see a common theme in this case. Mm -hmm. And this is conflicting reports, let's say. Yes, there's multiple. I mean, almost every detail that we do know is conflicted in some way. So there are many people that state that Henry had a few drinks. That's their words. Mm -hmm. A few drinks. But for some reason, he's so intoxicated that a friend has to confiscate his wallet so he cannot buy any more drinks. Now, we all know what kind of suspicions that leads us to think of. Right. And then you wonder, is there, well, I guess the question, the first question is, is there any speculation that he might've been doing drugs where one, his friends wouldn't know, Hmm. or maybe that his friends would know is he slipping into the bathroom and doing a little cocaine, a little nose candy. So here's what I would like to know. One, Hmm. I would like to know what is his, condition let's say at the nine o'clock hour when he arrives at the club Mm -hmm. like you said was he partying before he arrives to to party with his friends was he already drunk yeah was he pre-gaming so think about this this is a holiday weekend he's got the next day off that's why Mm -hmm. he's at a club on a sunday night who knows what was going on leading up to this so one i'd like to know more about henry's condition at the nine o'clock hour and I would also like a little more clarification on what was the what was going on at the club that night. Was it packed? Was there just a few people there? Right. You know, because you and I know just given the amount of people in the room can really add to conflicting stories. And we've seen in the past how many people all of a sudden want to be involved in a case that, you know, they really have nothing to offer 
as far as information goes. Now you got people coming out of the woodwork going, oh, yeah, I was at the club that night. I saw that guy. He, he, I think he only had one or two drinks. Right. Regardless, one consistent statement in this case is that the friend confiscated his wallet at some point so he could not buy more drinks. Mm-hmm. At 1.40 a.m. Well, let's just stop there because I want to, That on one hand, that makes it, him look suspicious. And on the other hand, it makes him look like a very good friend. So at 1.40 a.m., we have Calvin Johnson, one of Henry's friends. He says that he sees Henry leaving the club with the other guy that we mentioned, William Pappas Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Okay, so at 1.40 a.m., these two people are leaving the club. Now, he's going to be riding. Henry will be riding in William Kennedy's car. And why is he leaving? I don't know what time it would be closing time. I mean, 1.40 is pretty late. Most bars in Columbus close around 2 o'clock, but obviously this is not in Columbus, so we don't know exactly what time these bars shut down. It could be 4 a.m. for all we know. And it could have nothing to do with closing time. It could just be... He's, he's so drunk. He's 32. He's drunk. It's 1.40 in the morning. You got to go home sometime, right? <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite lines. It's when somebody says, you're drunk, go home. Yeah. Well, at 2.15 a.m., according to William Kennedy, who was driving Henry, Henry asked to be dropped off at a Super America gas station on Central and 73rd Avenue. However, cell pings place him in the area of Creekview Park in New Brighton. Most reports state that the phone is off after this. Okay, well, let's start with the idea that his buddy's going to drop him off at the gas station. Okay, maybe Henry's a smoker. Maybe he's going to try to get something to eat to sober up. We don't know. But we do know that the gas station has surveillance cameras. And right. there's no footage of him on those on those tapes. Let's back it up just a second, shall we? Mm-hmm. Because... Okay, let's like juvenile. Yeah, let's let's talk about this because we have uh Calvin Johnson who's saying he's so intoxicated I had to take his wallet. Yeah. And then you have another friend going, Well, he asked me to drop him off at a gas station and I did. I just well, turned <laughs> I just turned him loose. He was so drunk that I well, just maybe, turned him loose right, on the town. Maybe Johnson's the good friend and, and Kennedy's the, the shit friend. Could possibly I, I actually found this to be very Harry. upsetting to well i found mm-hmm. I, I found it to be very suspicious to yeah. be honest with you and when i first started looking into this the reports that i were reading i was reading made it sound like it was the same friend you know right, right. the same individual confiscated his wallet and dropped him off at a gas station in the middle of the night that's not true the reports are that calvin johnson was the one that took the wallet at some point. William Kennedy is the guy that drops him off at the gas station. Mm -hmm. Regardless, I still found this to be suspicious because I'm under the assumption he needs a ride home. Again, I want to know Henry McCabe's condition at nine, at 9 PM. Did he, how did he get to the club? Did he ride there with William Kennedy? Right. The, the thing I also wonder that's not talked about a lot is, is his wallet gone at this point or is his wallet back in his, possession at this point because you're going to drop me off at a gas station for one for what and won't i need money and did he have money outside of the wallet oh, i'll take my wallet but i still got some cash on me so i can get something at the gas station i was able to find an interview with this william kennedy and he offers to shine a little bit of light on the subject mm-hmm. to which he adds he says look i i wasn't like really good friends with henry we we just kind of knew each other. We weren't uh, best friends. We didn't run around in the same circles. Acquaintances. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what he says that their relationship was. So, but it changes though. You know, when when the person, you know, sometimes in these cases, somebody will quickly say, "Oh yeah, he was my buddy," and then once they're once they think they're a suspect, it's like, man, we weren't that close. Well, it's only thirteen minutes later. That at 2.28 a.m., a call is placed from Henry's phone, and like you and I had already said, it's confirmed that it comes from Henry's phone, Mm -hmm. and this call goes to his wife, Kareen. The call leaves a two-minute voicemail that, according to media, includes sounds of walking, falling, groans, moans, and things to the nature of, like, he got hurt or he's hurt. Right. And then towards the end... 
This is according to media. I've not heard this portion. According to the media, towards the end of the voicemail, a voice says, stop it. Now, do we know if that was a female voice or a male voice? I don't even think we know that, do we? Well, having not heard it, one, I don't know. But the thing that I find interesting here is that it's they they are very clear to say to specify that it's doesn't have to be Henry yelling stop it it could be somebody else they're not certain nobody's right. claiming to know who's saying stop it but with them saying that it could be Henry or it could not be Henry mm-hmm. my thought is leaning towards that it's probably a, a male sounding voice right and if there was if the voice had any female characteristics they might allude to that as well. Right. Um, And then it's the following day, Monday, September 7th, 2015, Kareen McCabe contacts and files a missing persons report with the Mounds View Police Department. Mm -hmm. So the following day, on Tuesday, the police conduct a search of the Super America gas station and the surrounding areas. All right, so continuing on the timeline. Yes, and there's a lot of confusing information out there regarding this voicemail. Like I said, at the center of this case, this strange voicemail. And what I mean by confusion is that we have the wife says she receives the call, Henry's wife. However, there are reports out there that state his brother was the one that received the voicemail. Hmm. I believe that the reason for this confusion, it's actually very simple and very clear. I think that, I'm very happy to clear it all up for you guys right here, right now. Well, thank you, Colonel. It sounds to me that the call 100% came from Henry's phone and went to his wife's phone. Mm -hmm. Voicemail left on his wife's cell phone. However, the person that brought the voicemail to the media and released it and gave it to the media was his brother. That makes sense. That's where the confusion lies. So it's very simple. He left this voicemail for his wife. Now, regarding his wife, Corrine, she's actually in California. This takes place in Minnesota. According to what law enforcement have stated, Corrine was in California preparing for a move. The whole family was going to move to California for some reason. Right. Now, in an interview with Corrine, she simply says, look, Henry was spending time with some friends that he hadn't seen in a long time. That statement I find to be weird when we have the other gentleman saying, Hey, we're just acquaintances. Right. She says that she yeah, actually but she might just be simplifying it by lumping them all together. Well, he's, and it, he's going out there to see one friend ends up hanging out with a friend and an acquaintance. Well, and again, that's the problem with this case, with this story, mm-hmm. what's going on at the club. How many people was he meeting up with at the club? Right. You know? So anyway, 5,000, right? So, spending time with some friends that he had not seen in a long time. She says that she actually spoke to him that night and she believes that she spoke to Henry around the time that they were getting ready to leave the club. At that point, he says something like, I'll call you back later. Mm. So at that point, she's saying he's coherent, right? Then she gets later, much later, she gets that strange call in the middle of the night. That's left on her voicemail to which she tries to call him back. And she then says that her calls are going straight to his voicemail at that point. So now she's worried. And the next morning she reports her husband as missing. And also if it's going straight to voicemail, you're assuming at that point his phone was dead. Right. And so here's some other things that we should throw in there. It's, it's been reported that the McCabe's were experiencing financial difficulties at this time Mm -hmm. that they had defaulted on their rent. Uh, Henry had received a bad review at work and was uh, reportedly having work issues at that time. Mm -hmm. Now there are no issues. Do we know just issues Uh, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, we have the, the specific information of he had just received a bad review at work. Right. Um, if usually if you get a bad review, you are having some kind of work issues leading up yeah, to that. Yeah. So there is no report or indication of marital problems between the two. And as we said, Kareen was in California with their children at that time. And she did return to 
Minnesota on September 10th to aid in search efforts. Yeah, and you also wonder at this point, okay, this married guy, he's still pretty young, has two kids, he's going out drinking with his buddies. You know, is it, uh, you know, a different area codes, area codes type of situation? Is he just going out to drink with some buddies? Is he looking to try to find a lady to hook up with? Well, so the search, we, we mentioned that the search has started at the Super America gas station, mm -hmm. right? And then the surrounding areas. The Super America gas station, this is the way that they planned out these searches. Let's put everybody at this gas station where we have been told is the last lo last known location of Henry McCabe, right? Right. And we're going to have everybody fan out and search from this gas station walking back to his residence. Yeah, it seems like a logical. It's a 35-minute mm. walk. So according to his driver, according to the man that was driving him, he requested to be dropped off there. It seems like quite a distance to try to trek it on your own. Right. But especially if you're, drunk, if you're yeah. then you might not care. So you might not know. The other thing I had to wonder about too, with this friend or acquaintance, whatever we want to label him as dropping Henry off in the middle of the night at a gas station. Right. You have to wonder, you, you ever get that person that's really intoxicated and you're trying to help them, but they're just so damn annoying that you give up at some point you quit trying to be reasonable mm -hmm. you know if if he's throwing a fit or if he just insists and insists and insists on being dropped off at the gas station at some point do you just give in and go all right buddy you're a grown man well yeah well, I was trying to figure out if this gas station was known to have uh sex workers there hmm. because sometimes in these small towns you you might have walkers Right. Uh, when I lived in Richmond, Indiana, we had walkers, but there was one or two stops like a gas station here or a business here that they would kind of hang around. Uh, or like when we covered the uh, vanishing girls in Jellicothe, they're all hanging around right. the, the McDonald's. And so was this a situation where it was, hey, I know that there's. I mean, what is the reason that you're dropping him off? Right. That, that that would be a big reason. And if he's not saying, oh, well, he didn't say, well, maybe he said that, but this guy doesn't want to talk bad about this guy. You'd think there would have to be some kind of information because in that interview, William basically says, was he going to meet someone there? I don't know. Mm -hmm. He offers up no explanation for why Henry wanted to be dropped off there. It sounds like Henry was insisting on it, according to William's words. He mm -hmm. just keeps saying, drop me off here. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. This is my area. To which then he drops him off. Now, later in the investigation, Captain, we will learn that Henry was never dropped off at the Super America gas station. We'll get into that more after this quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. 
The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today. All right, we're back. Cheers. Cheers to you, Captain. I'm, I'm getting extra saucy today. So it's about three weeks into the disappearance of missing person Henry McCabe when law enforcement learn that he was actually dropped off at a different gas station that night. Mm -hmm. So we have his acquaintance who says he convinced me to drop him off at the Super America gas station. Turns out he was dropped off at a holiday gas station, mm -hmm. which is about three miles on the same strip but it's three miles further away from Henry's home. All right. So here's what I wonder. Was Kennedy a little intoxicated when he dropped off Henry? And just this was a mistake. He just said I, he told the police the wrong gas station. Or did he give him the wrong gas station on purpose? You read my mind because that's what I thought of at first. I'm like, this Kennedy dude seems very shady, very suspicious. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he tells them the wrong place. Hey, I dropped him off at this gas station. They can't find any uh, surveillance footage of that happening. And then later they're able to determine that he was actually dropped off at this holiday gas station, but that's because they found surveillance footage of him being dropped off there. So what I think that we have here is almost exactly what you said. And, and you know, it's a situation and nobody do this at home, you know, but it's one of those situations oh, where oh, hold on, Wait, go ahead, keep going. It's one of those situations where the I believe the least intoxicated person drove. Yeah, don't that do night. that. So nothing good comes of that, and I actually think that this is a honest mistake. Mm -hmm. Let's call it that, because I think that's why Kennedy would stick to his story for three weeks, saying, "No, you can say whatever you want. You know, there's I don't care that there's no footage of." of me dropping him off. I know I dropped him off at this gas station. Well, and, but now there's footage of Henry at the holiday gas station. Correct. Okay. So, so, but is it possible that he dropped him off at the one and Henry made his way down three miles, uh, you know, to, to the other gas station. I've not been able to find the actual footage and I don't know that it's been released, mm -hmm. but the way that it's been described is that it's, of Kennedy dropping him off at this other gas station. Well, it's, I mean, this this case has conspiracy written all over it. I mean, you got a guy named with the last name Kennedy and a guy with the last name Johnson. We know what happened last time those two were in office. Well, and the thing here is we've discussed this on our show before where we have a witness or we have someone that's trying to offer up information in an investigation and that information turns out to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are lying. If they are telling you the truth, but they're just mistaken, it's not necessarily a lie. And in Kennedy's defense, I've seen photographs of both of these gas stations. Okay, so they're, they're the same type of business, obviously. However, they have the same like colors. You know how like Super America is like red, white, and blue? Right. From what I could see of the holiday gas station, it's red, white, and blue as well. Okay, so again, we have a guy named Kennedy, a guy named Johnson. We have gas stations that are red, white, and blue. Huh? Well, what what Conspiracy. I think may have happened here is I think Kennedy just got the wrong gas station. Right, right. You know, just told him the wrong gas station. So the other thing, too, is you have to wonder how well did Kennedy know the area. You know, and, and the other thing, too, people point out, well, he dropped him off further away from... McCabe's home. Well, Kennedy may have had no idea where McCabe actually lived. Right. So that doesn't seem suspicious, suspicious in of itself. So I don't know that that really has anything to do with Kennedy, you know, or, mm -hmm. or what he says happened that night. The thing here though, is captain we have on 
It's two months later, two months after Henry goes missing, a kayaker found a body in Rush Lake. This is about seven miles away. On November 2nd, a body is found, and by November 3rd, it's identified as being the body of Henry McCabe. Okay. There are there were all kinds of talk about this uh, body being found, obviously. One, the first reports that were coming out suggested that the body was weighted down. Mm-hmm. However, all the later reports would never mention that it was weighted down and only say that it was partially submerged. Okay. And it was near some brush. One thing I want to point out about this Rush Lake is this lake is has a very, to put it as simple as possible, weedy shoreline. Mm-hmm. They've shown, you know, you can see news footage of this area. It looked to me to be very difficult for anyone to get into that lake. Well, and then the question is the wording. Because weighted down, when I hear weighted down, I hear somebody tied a rope around a cinder block. That's what, when I hear weighted down, but weighted down could mean weighted down by something on the shoreline. And I think that's what we have here because the words partially submerged and near some brush almost indicates that the body kind of got caught underneath something that was making it harder to, for anybody to find. Yeah. You know, it was almost two months before his body is found. According to reports, what was found in the autopsy is that it's ruled an accidental drowning in fresh water. Mm -hmm. So let me get into this. Yeah, because this is getting weirder. Yeah, and here's a a big problem that I kind of have with this case. So we've reviewed many cases that have been ruled an accidental death or a suspicious death Mm -hmm. or then later changed to accidental death. Typically, what I have found is that the autopsies for those accidental deaths are pretty readily available. You can find them. Right. You know, we know this from the Diane Schuler case and from Kendrick Johnson's case. Mm-hmm. I think that the reason why that is is the case in those instances is that they look when they say it's an accidental death. They, they want it to be very black and white and, and very transparent for everybody to go, look, you can view this yourself. Right. This is what we came up with. However, in Henry's case, I can't find the autopsy anywhere. And maybe it's out there, but I've looked high and low and can't find the thing. I can find a bazillion reports that state what is said in the autopsy, but I can't view the actual autopsy itself. Right. So I find that a little questionable let's say, and I do want to really hit home this idea of the lake from video footage that I've seen and from pictures that I've seen. It doesn't appear that this lake is very accessible at all. It it, it would take some difficulty. And what I mean by that is you have one thought that he was heavily intoxicated or maybe he was drugged up by mm-hmm. by his own doing or somebody else's doing, and he ended up in this lake on accident. Right, but we have evidence of something, some kind of struggle. Now, we, we don't know for certain if those noises that we hear on the voicemail are coming from Henry. We don't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, let's just assume they are because they're coming from his phone. Right. And then at some point you have somebody saying, stop it. Okay, stop it. And then you're going to tell me that this guy actually, you know, accidentally drowned. Mm-hmm. You know, this autopsy doesn't seem to make sense. Do we have any puncture? Do we have, there's no signs of a struggle. There's no signs of a uh, bruising. The no. exact wording is there are no marks on the body. Mm-hmm. No signs of trauma to the body. Uh, yeah. So. Well, let's, I mean, let, let me point out some obvious stuff here. Mm-hmm. I mean, take um, take the Kendrick Johnson case, right? Mm-hmm. We have weird, suspicious things, and then we have this autopsy that says, no, it's accidental, right? Mm-hmm. And then in the Kanika Jenkins case in, in Chicago, we have a, a young lady walking around like a drugged-up zombie mm-hmm. found in a freezer, accidental. Mm-hmm. Now we have a guy... That leaves a bar, he's probably intoxicated, makes a call, 
leaves a long voice message with crazy sounds and somebody saying, stop it. And he was found in the river. And now we're going to say it's, it's an accident. (sighs) You know, it seems like all three victims are, are black, right? Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me that with evidence like this, they're so quick to come out with this accidental, it's accidental and that's done. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's so irresponsible. Well, okay, let's say that the information is 100% accurate and correct in this autopsy from the reports we are hearing about the autopsy. Well, this I think this is going to be a case that we hear later that they, you know, assume the body and, 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 and do another autopsy. So for it to be an accidental drowning, it, there needs to be water in the lungs or in the windpipes. Right. Right. So that really only leaves you if, if there is no trauma to the body, if there is no marks on the body, there right. was water found in the lungs or windpipes that we don't know. Cause we've not seen the actual autopsy, but if that is the case, then you're kind of left with one of two scenarios. Either he did accidentally drown in the lake mm-hmm. or somebody held him underwater. Right. And the weird thing about that is those gurgle noises and the, some of the noises you hear on that short clip, they go with both of those scenarios, right. but to a point of somebody yelling, stop it, which again, we can't confirm actually happens because we, we can't hear that portion of the tape. Right. And, and look, is it a little suspicious that this tape uh, was rumored to be out on the internet and now it's not, I mean, that's a little suspicious to me. The other thing that I find very weird is like, I, I, again, I really want to hit this home. If he ended up in that lake with no marks on his body, I want somebody to tell me how that happened because I've seen how thick the brush is around this lake. I've seen there's trees, there's weeds. It's not like there's a, there's a cleared shoreline where you could just waltz on into the lake. That you've seen video that I've seen. Right. There are a couple, from my understanding, there are at least two, maybe three creeks that would feed into that body of water. Well, I'm, and I'm going to, you know, dispute your point a little bit. If a kayaker is finding this, that we probably have drop zones and pickup zones. That's a very good point. That there's there's a launch point, right? You know, for right. at least for the kayaker. And if there is, you know, because my buddy. Uh, Rainbow River Kayak and Canoe down in Donellan, Florida. Tell them the captain sent you. But I do got a buddy that that runs um, a kayak and canoe delivery service. And where their drop-in points and their pickup points, they're very clear. So So let's get into some interesting theories. Because there's there's a bazillion of them, obviously. But I've kind of narrowed it down. I've put a short list together of mine. Well, let me put... Let me toss out the first one so we can get rid of it. Because one, I own Crocs, and and I only wear them when I'm watching Finding Bigfoot. And some of these noises on this tape that in the weird conspiracy groups, they'll bring up Bigfoot. Okay, I don't know if you've seen these. Yeah, you can't miss them. Um, because of what people think that the Bigfoot calls sound like. Okay, uh, that these guttural growls to high end howls, you know, kind of like a mm-hmm. type sound. Um, they would say, this is a Bigfoot noise. This is a noise that they make. This is a call. So, but again, if he comes in contact with a Bigfoot and the Bigfoot is the one that puts him in the water, mm-hmm. you're going to have some markings of that. I would believe. I would think so. I would just assume, look, like I said, I do enjoy watching shows on Bigfoots and aliens and all that stuff. I think it's fun and entertaining. Uh, I just don't know if we have any uh, scientific proof that they even exist. So right. It's hard, it's hard to entertain those theories when you're talking about things. We have no confirmation if they exist. Right. And then for, you know, look, for all I know, Bigfoot could live on the corner of Main and High Street mm-hmm. in somebody's basement. I don't know. But from my understanding... What are you saying? Have you seen this? No, but what I'm saying is mm-hmm. my understanding of this area is it's fairly residential. That it's mm-hmm. not... We're not talking about he... This is not... Um, this is not Dennis Martin, who was somebody that was out in the middle of nowhere. You know, National Forest, National Park right. type situation. This is fairly residential. So I think the the most interesting theories that I saw 
would be heavily intoxicated or maybe somebody drugged him with GHB. Very possible. And that there is some form of hallucination that he freaked out and ran, you know, probably could have ran aimlessly through the woods, through the brush, into the water and accidentally drown in the lake. Well, and think about this. I'm going to put some logic behind your theory here. He's on something, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know what he's on. At the very least, he had drinks in him. Right. He had drinks in him, possibly some GHB, right? Mm Mm-hmm. He gets his friend to drop him off. He says, okay, you're drunk. You're out of control. I'm going to let you go. He starts making a scene. Um, For whatever reason, he tries to call to get help. Uh, Maybe he's on Quaaludes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that's a drug that's a blast from the past. But look at the scene in Wolf of Wall Street where he's talking into the phone and making zero sense. He's just making noises. Mm Mm-hmm. That that's happens here. Now, I'm not saying it's quaaludes, but it could be some kind of mind-altering drug. He's making zero sense and maybe making some commotion, and it's somebody at the gas station telling him, okay, stop. Like, stop acting this way. And from there, he takes off, finds his way into the water, and then it's accidental drowning. We have his wife, and we also have Henry's brother. These two, I would argue, know Henry longer or better than most, if not anyone else. Yeah, correct. Okay. Both of these individuals state that some of the noises, and it's unclear to me as to which Mm -hmm. of the noises, but both of them have stated publicly that some of the noises sound like Henry to them. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and go off of that. that They're probably correct on that, that some of these noises are being made by Henry that's left on the voicemail. Both... Well, more particularly his wife, Corrine, she insists that this is not a call for help, that this was a pocket dial, you know, a butt dial that, that she, the voicemail is leaving noises that are picked up by his phone from an accidental call. Okay. Uh, unintended call. Right. So let's go through some possibilities with this though, because there's one big, uh, theory out there and the, actually i believe it was on reddit that i i read a, quite a lengthy thread you read it on reddit i <laughs> read it on reddit mm-hmm. uh quite a lengthy thread regarding the ghb theory i and, just look for all true crime fans i think reddit is great i mean is there going to be some nonsense on there of course be, but there's some great information and great theories even if it's a theory with no evidence to back it up it's still an interesting theory, and you can find almost every case on Reddit. Web sleuths as well. Both yeah, of, yes. Both Definitely. of them are fantastic, but I'll throw this caveat out there. And this is why neither of them are, are my first go-to for a case. Of course. Because they're very lengthy, uh, usually in the threads. And like you said, there's some stuff in there that's just boring or not important to the case. And you kind of have to sift your way through it as you go. Right. So... But one really interesting thread I found on there was GHB, and people were talking about a couple different scenarios. First, there was, I believe, a, a nurse or doctor on there that was stating, hey, I've, I've encountered people that have ingested large amounts of GHB, and they gargle and make noises, like, like what yeah. you were talking about with the Quaaludes and Wolf of Wall Street. Right. And then there was another individual on there that was stating, hey, you know, sometimes at these clubs, and this is their experience, <laughs> I'm not hip enough to have <laughs> this kind of experience or go to places that would have this going on that I know of. But this person was saying that sometimes at these at certain clubs or raves or parties or whatever, that some people ingest large amounts of GHB on accident okay. because from what this person says, it's a clear liquid and they had had an experience where a friend of theirs thought they were picking up like a a glass of vodka or a bottle of vodka Uh kind of chugged it, you know, took a couple big schwills out of it and ended up, turns out it was not vodka and they were pretty, pretty messed up. And we've also seen in several cases and I've actually been diving into this reports of actual bartenders that drug customers 
almost as like, oh, you're a shitty tipper. Okay, it's time for me to drug you, and I'm going to watch you uh, have a really hard time tonight. It's not going to kill you, but you're going to have a really hard time. But if you're what you're saying uh, in a scenario like that, well, then this guy was killed by something like that. Under this thought and theory, this kind of makes a little bit of sense because we have people stating earlier, he only had a few drinks, but on the other hand, we have people saying he was so intoxicated we had to take his wallet from him so he couldn't buy any more drinks. Right. So that kind of, if if those two things are true, absolutely true, then this theory works within those guidelines. Right. Now, here's another interesting one. Regarding the pocket call, you know, Kareen says this is a pocket call or, or an but, unintended uh, call. Yeah. There is a theory out there that is some type of police cover up. And of course, you know, this is people get angry. Of course, right, so, right. With somebody somewhere, somebody's very angry right it's now. It's always Bigfoot or a police cover up. The Bigfoot working in cahoots with the police. The police have been covering up for Bigfoot since possibly that they that the big that Bigfoot lives at the police department. Since, they've been covering up for Bigfoot since the late eighteen mm-hmm. hundreds at least. I mean, yeah. that's as far back as I can trace it. Yeah. Anyway, this this theory works like this: that Henry was walking home from the gas station where he was dropped off. At some point, a police officer pulls over or approaches him with the thought that he would be arrested for public intoxication. Right. Somehow they get into it. There's an altercation and the police tase Henry Mm -hmm. to which he has a bad reaction. Maybe it's a heart attack. I don't know. Uh, But for whatever reason, he he dies or almost dies from this uh, situation. Yeah. And then to cover it up, he's placed in the lake at some point. His body's not discovered for two more months. I do want to throw out there, though, one thing that makes this extra tough extra difficult level here is that he's he's in that lake for almost two months i mean right. w- what is lost what evidence is lost to tell us what happened to henry during the course of that time a ton but what wouldn't be lost is if there was beating or bruising or any of that stuff or a puncture that's not going to be lost so but the tough thing about this theory is one most cops for the most part are, have good intentions Right. They're there to serve and protect. So the likelihood that a cop would come around, tase a guy, he dies, and then if his partner is saying, hey, stop it, now you're going to tell me that two cops that signed up to serve and protect killed an innocent man and threw him into the river? Because let's say he's on drugs or drunk and he is fighting the cops that they probably have body cams or dash cams or whatever. Mm-hmm. So now you got to get rid of that evidence if you just killed this man. But if this guy was attacking you and and this was you defending yourself, you'd have that evidence on a dash cam or a body cam to then to, to protect your ass, to say, hey, look, we were just trying to control him. He attacked us, and then it was an accidental death because of that. You see what I mean? Right. So... Do we have any evidence that there's any uh, camera footage missing from any of these officers? Or do they even have these on their um, vehicles? Well, the other thing, too, is we don't have any witnesses saying they saw anything like this at all, right. number one. Number two, the way that this theory is is spoke of would be that during the course of that butt dial, what we're hearing is... Henry being tased or attacked by the police. Right. And then he's killed, right? Or then he dies. Okay. Like you said, no marks on the body. Very little, if no trauma at all, signs of trauma to the body. So there's a big problem there that you have to get over. The other problem that you have to get over too, that's not discussed, is that what we hear from from that portion of the voicemail is, the only time that anybody says that words are spoken is one person selling, yelling or saying, stop it. Right. Everything else is just noises. So what, where I'm going with this captain is police are very vocal when they are trying to control someone, when they are trying to get them to listen to them, when they are trying to get them to go along with their instructions, 
they're extremely vocal. Right. And the 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 more that you disobey them, the more that you don't listen to them, the louder they tend to get. Yes. You I would think that if this scenario is correct, you would hear a lot of police chatter. You would hear a lot of being told to get on the ground. Stop it. Put your hands in the air. Put your hands where I can see them. A lot of that stuff. And that is not, nobody at any time says that they hear that on the voicemail. Right. But we only have a clip. We don't have the full voicemail. Right. But, but the thing I have with that is we have, we do know that his wife and brother both have listened to the entirety of the voicemail. Right. And I think that if either of them thought that a police officer or police officers were responsible for what happened to Henry, I think that would have came out in the media Mm -hmm. and the media would have been very happy to broadcast that for us, you know, especially they they normally are. Yeah. So I, I think that I can, I'm wiping that theory away just because I think that if they're look where there's smoke, there's fire. But what I'm getting at is there's no smoke here. Yeah, but I'm not wiping that away. And the reason why is because, like I said, I think this case, because there's so many fishy scenarios and because the call one, look, release the call, mm-hmm. release that to the public, especially if you say it's an accident. Yeah. And and if people are saying, hey, this is possibly a com- uh, police conspiracy, release the audio. Mm-hmm. Let us hear for ourselves what is on that audio clip. OK, the other thing, too, is release the autopsy. OK, let's see what ha- that what happens there. OK, now. The autopsy may be released. I Like just, I said, just I just can't find, find it. it. I, right, but you find it for almost every other case. Right. And so you didn't find it for this one. I'm not going to blame you. Okay. There's a lot of people in this story that I'm going to blame, but I'm not going to be blaming you. Well, thank you. <laughs> no, but okay. But so we have all these. Then we have the, the situation with his friend dropping him off or stating that he dropped him at a different location than what he actually dropped him off to. But I, I believe with this, with the autopsy, with the, with the lack of evidence other than this weird call, this voicemail, at some point the family should get a collection from the community, get supporters behind you and, and just do another autopsy, have a second opinion Look at this to see if anything was fishy. And it might come back simply, yes, it was accidental drowning and he possibly was on something. Mm-hmm. And at least you would have answers. And I think uh, that's the least they could do because Henry deserves that. I mean, this guy seems to have done nothing wrong in his life. He went out one night drinking. Did he drink too, too much? Did he take? Did he take something he shouldn't have taken? Was he was he trying to party too hard? But we can get answers, I think, from the second autopsy. Yeah. And so I don't want anybody to think that we didn't talk about a possible animal attack because that's one of that's one of the leading theories. But you pointed out very clearly that kind of goes along with the Bigfoot theory. If right. there, there's no marks on the body. Well, you know? other so, than and, the fact that the other animals are probably real. Yeah. And so if it, this were going to be an animal attack, some people say that the noises you're hearing on the voicemail are coming from an animal that's attacking him. Right. But the problem with that, again, there's no marks on the body. If this were an animal attack, unless the animal managed to scare him, frighten him and chase him into the river or into the lake, and then he accidentally drowned, um, the animal attack just doesn't, doesn't play out here for me. Well, and this would be difficult too, because let's say a dog... Uh, got a hold of his shirt or something that the rips of that shirt could be similar to the rips in the shirt once he's submerged in water for that length mm-hmm. and and hitting the shoreline there could be similar markings on on clothes and that that could be a possibility where something did attack him and never really made contact with his body but again, I think the answers are going to really lie with the second autopsy. Just to, you know, I think he deserves that. This, I think we all, you know, anybody, anybody that's listening that this could possibly happen to, you know, you, your family owes that to you to just go, hey, let's let's get a second opinion and just make sure that it's correct. 
One theory that is, I find to be probably the most interesting out of all that have been discussed is a possible revenge killing. Mm -hmm. And the thought being that the voicemail was no accident, that, that whomever is responsible purposely dialed his phone and let, let it pick up whatever noises it could during the drowning process of Henry McCabe. Right. And that they, whoever killed him wanted his family or whoever was going to be picking up the phone to hear that, that it was some kind of well, revenge. Kill. Uh, then my other question then becomes too, is this, is this cell phone that he had, is it waterproof? Is it something that you could put in water? And is that the reason why we're hearing some weird sounds? Because the phone itself is submerged in water. Is that a possibility? Let me ask you this, and because this is one of the more, more troubling of the facts in this case, or lack of facts. Could you find anywhere hard proof that the phone was found, that the phone was located? Because this voicemail is on his wife's phone. Right. You know, no, I have not heard anything about his phone being found. Or not found. Correct. And that, that really bothered me. I don't know what we can gather from from it if it were to have been found. Somebody's yelling at us right now going, well, what you'd get from that is, and we, you know, we're just drawing a blank. But that's what you get when you spend hours and hours recording in the garage. You get blank brains sometimes. The uh, one thing that I find. Well, you, yeah, but you would know the model number. Somebody should know the model number, and that would let us know. And also, was the phone, did the phone hang up? Because remember when they said- did it hang uh, up or go dead. Right, because- Because the call ends at some point. The call ends at some point, and then when she starts calling, it goes straight to voicemail. Mm -hmm. Well, it would do the same thing if the phone was submerged in water. The phone would probably record, even if it's not waterproof, for a while. And that's where you could get some distortion in frequencies. So- Let's say the phone was picking up something that was a lower frequency. Well, you could ha then start having glitches where so when you have this guttural growl to a higher pitch noise, these things could be altered by the phone start starting to malfunction underwater. I so necessarily it doesn't have to be. Um, I mean, he could be calling for help as they're pushing him down into the water. So. You just said something. You just hit a home run there. I'm going to circle back to that, but I do want to clean up something that I said earlier. When I said, to, for me to make the statement that his wife, Corrine, said that she was trying to call him and it was going straight to voicemail, Right. I don't know that that's true. I believe her exact words from that interview were, I, I tried calling him back and I kept getting his voicemail. So I, I, right. it could have gone straight to voicemail. But I just want to clean that up a little bit to to say exactly what she said, that she kept oh, getting his voicemail. Well, it's really nice that at the last minute of the show, I think we did come up with some very interesting thoughts. Here's a thought, though. What? And I'm going to take it a little excerpt. Well, make excerpt. it a good one because I don't want to end on a bad one. I want to take a little excerpt from what you just said, where I said, I think you hit a home run and I want to circle back to it. Okay. Your statement, you said he could have been calling for help, right? Yeah. Those are your words. I think that's genius. And here's where I have a big problem with this case and with the statements of those surrounding Henry and who was in Henry's life at the time of his death. Every interview I could find with Corrine, she constantly says that he pocket called me, that he pocket dialed me. At no point is there ever any mention of the thought that he could have been calling for help. So what you're saying is you think that's suspicious on her end that she very never thought very suspicious. He would call her for help. Right. I, I think that it's strange that I review multiple interviews with her and at no point does she ever say he could have been calling for help. Right. But this is also an idea that, through interviews or through talking with the police or through talking with anybody that maybe she ruled that out as a possibility mm -hmm. before she did these interviews that we've, we have seen. True, true. But I, I think we're talking about a case that it's very difficult to rule out possibilities. Yeah. I'd love to hear people's thoughts and opinions on this case. You can do so 
at True Crime Garage. Go to our blog. And again, share this information with your friends and family. Tell people about the show. I'd love to hear people's theories personally. Other than my, I strongly believe that another autopsy, if we can do one, if his body was cremated, then at least have the first autopsy reviewed by an outside source. Thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure you share on social media, tell your friends. And if you need to listen to the old episodes or want to listen to the old episodes, download the Stitcher app. It's free and all of our episodes are there exclusively. And until next time, everybody be good, be kind and don't litter. Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. 